welcome everyone. Um, it's great to have you here today. I think while we wait for other people to join, we may get, can maybe start introducing ourselves and then we can go and start like answering your questions about uh, international fellows uh, at Biodesign. So I'll start and uh, yeah, my name is Marta. I'm originally from Barcelona in Spain. I hold a PhD in pharmacy and during my PhD, I became really interested in innovation and entrepreneurship. That's why I decided to pursue an MBA and have like uh, more information on the business aspect of things. And that's why I also made a career change from R&D into a startup accelerator back in Barcelona. And then I was fortunate enough to join the fellowship, uh, which I've been part of by design for two years now. I'm currently part of the Impact One team, which is focused on innovation in kids and maternal health. Um, and yeah, happy to answer any questions. So yeah, for example, Zayan, do you want to go next? Sure, thanks, Marta. Good morning, everyone. Good evening from wherever you are joining us in the world. I'm really happy that so many of you have logged on because we are always thrilled to get more international applicants for biodesign. As Marta said, my name is Zayan. I'm originally from Johannesburg, South Africa. I trained as a physician and then became really interested in solving system issues and thinking about prevention. And so studied public health from there at King's College London. And during that time, my thesis actually looked at how lo low cost innovation can be um, a benefit for the whole of society for surgical care, specifically in low and middle income contexts. And that brought me to biodesign where I did the innovation fellowship and have stayed on. I now serve as a health equity lead where I help innovators and various teams and classes think about unintended consequences, how to make healthcare more accessible, how to um, innovate for underserved groups, and how to ensure that the innovations we produce here at Biodesign are effective, but also equitable. I'll pass it on to Nathaniel. Yeah, hello everyone, and welcome to the call. Um, Nathaniel George, um, uh, entrepreneur, turned from a physician back in Nigeria. So I have an MBBS degree back home. I started um, by having a very strong passion, you know, similar to Cyan, it's difficult coming from Africa and not um, having those passions for solving healthcare problems at the primary healthcare level. So I've really focused a lot on um, trying to improve health access gaps uh, doing this by starting a company just after medical school. So uh, it's been a very tough transition for me going from physician to entrepreneur, but having the opportunity to do the Biodesign Fellowship has really uh, helped to streamline things a lot. And uh, it's an opportunity that has really transformed a lot of things for me personally and for a lot of people um, in terms of patients and in terms of fellows and alums. So really hoping that many of you on this call would uh, end up doing the fellowship and happy to talk further about our experience so far. Um, turning it over to Anastasia. Hello, everybody. My name is Anastasia. I'm originally from Greece. My background is in electrical and computer engineering. Um, and through my PhD, I geared towards AI and digital biomarkers. And from there, my love for digital health was born. So before Biodesign, um, I had co-founded a couple of digital health startups, really focusing on how we can use consumer devices for continuous disease monitoring and diagnostics. And uh, then I joined the Innovation Fellowship last year with Nathaniel and Ignacio, which has been a, an amazing experience. And this year I continue with Biodesign with a second year fellowship focusing on entrepreneurs' resilience and well-being, while also continuing one of our projects that we did last year in oncology. And I'm excited to hear your questions and I'm passing it on to Ignacio. Thank you, Anastasia. Well, hi everyone, welcome to the call. My name is Ignacio Perez. I am an internal medicine physician, uh, trained, born and raised in Santiago, Chile. And um, besides medicine, I've always been interested in informatics. So as a medical student and then as an early physician, I was working in health informatics, uh, trying to understand how population health management could be improved. And 
while working in that space, I ended up realizing that actually, even though I was really interested about informatics, what I was really interested in was solving problems. And at that point, it became clear that and knowing which problem to work on is something that is not so easy to realize. And Biodesign just happens to provide such a wonderful framework for identifying unmet needs and then identifying which need you want to work on. So uh, after identifying Biodesign, I um, completed my residency and was lucky enough to be able to come here and do this fellowship with Anastasia, with Nathaniel. And as Anastasia said, I had also got the opportunity to stay as a second year fellow uh, this year working on um, specific congenital heart disease problems while also continuing to work on the project that we pushed forward during our first year in the fellowship. And as Megan mentioned through the chat, please feel free to, to ask us any questions and we'll, we'll answer them. I think we still don't have um, any questions, so I'll start first. Maybe Anastasia, could you please tell me like, what's your favorite thing about living in the Bay Area? And also all of us stayed or were able to stay at Biodesign for at least one more year. What was the main thing that uh, made you take this decision and why are we all so lucky to be part of, of Biodesign? Yeah, that's a very good question, Marta. Um, my favorite thing is living in the Bay Area, okay? I guess the weather is definitely one of them. And coming from Greece, I really appreciate that it's always sunny and nice here. Um, I really like the, the Stanford community and the Biodesign community. I feel there is like a, a bubble in this area where everyone is very open-minded, accepting, ambitious, um, and passionate to have impact. So it's very inspirational being there. And also um, Bay Area has, and California in general, beautiful nature. Um, so it's really, really nice to be able to do impactful cool work and then also <laughs> go see the nature. Um, thinking specifically about biodesign and why I decided to stay for a second year, um, there were a couple of reasons. First of all, I feel like it's such an intense experience that you need some time to reflect on what you've learned and try to reapply it again to feel like uh, you have really um, mastered the whole process. So um, I feel that this year will give me some time to uh, really hone in on the methodology and some aspects of it. Um, I was also very passionate about the project we started last year, so it's super cool to see how it can go beyond uh, 10 months is a very short period, and especially when you're evaluating so many different needs, so actually having a concentrated time to work on our last uh, last project um, is, is super exciting. And then lastly, the specifically the fellowship I am doing right now, the Stanford Entrepreneurs and Resilience and Wellbeing Fellowship, it's a first, the first time this fellowship starts. So it's also exciting uh, to be part of the first year of this fellowship. Uh, it is very different. We are looking on how, what are the factors that really make entrepreneurs resilient and successful and how we can bring more underrepresented groups within the founders community. And this was a passion of mine in parallel um, with my work in digital health. Um, so I'm really excited and really happy to have the opportunity to be around this community of of like innovators for another year. Uh, yeah, how about the rest of you guys? I know like we're all kind of sticking around <laughs> and we have a lot of questions in the chat too to go as well afterwards. I will um, add on to that by just saying that uh, and answering hopefully one of the questions in the chat that there isn't a definite number of second year fellowships that changes every year based on the funding. So we have our pediatric device consortium funding, which sponsors impact one, which sometimes offers a fellowship in impact one. And there's various different types of fellowships. Um, as Anastasia just mentioned, the one she's doing is new, the health equity one I did was new. And so there's not a guaranteed amount of fellowships. So it's important that if you come, there's not the expectation that it will definitely be a second year fellowship or that you will be able to stay on that is determined by grant funding received in whatever year that happens and um yeah it, it uh, there was a question around how many years can you stay on 
Uh, the idea is that you do the fellowship and there is an opportunity to do a second year fellowship, but that is sort of seen as the maximum amount of time for fellows unless you're taking on a different role at biodesign. Yeah, I see a question from Kosibi. I would like to jump on that. Uh, he's asking, how do you make your application stand out? Um, I think the best advice I would have uh, regarding that would be to be yourself as much as possible. Um, I think the, the fellowship is very well suited to support your dreams and your aspirations and your passions. And so if you're not presenting your authentic self, I think that can uh, pose a problem and be a distraction for you in terms of you not receiving the kind of support you need in order to align with your uh, future aspirations. So I would say when it comes to the application, be as honest and as authentic as possible, but also be as creative as possible. You know, this is a, a fellowship that's really about uh, innovation and the innovation goes way beyond just only medical device, medical devices. So it should reflect in every area of um, that application, be it your verbal communication, be it your written, be it your teamwork, always um, make sure that you're expressing all the creativity that, that you have in you, but make sure that it's um, as authentic to yourself as possible. I think that's my take on that question. And building on that and regarding the question about like previous experiences and how this has helped us succeed in the program, I think, um, yeah, in general, like as uh, Nate said, it's more about like being yourself and also like any previous experience that you have had will be hugely helpful during the fellowship because everyone in the team has a different background. So having people with real experience, for example, in R&D, in business, in consulting, in uh well as physicians uh different potential experiences i think helps a lot to have different perspectives within the team and also knowing that you have at least one person who's an expert so that's why in general like when it comes to applications um it is recommended to have at least about like five years of professional experience so that not only you are interested in innovation but also you can bring like some of your technical clinical or business expertise and in my particular case, for example, I was like really interested in, in innovation. So I tried to, to build like, um, like a CV that covered all the aspects that I believed were needed for innovation, not only like the PhD in pharma, but also like training in entrepreneurship, tech transfer, IT, and also uh, the MBA to have like the business perspective. And I believe that uh, most of the fellows also have like mixed backgrounds within, yeah like technical, but also knowing about different types of technologies like uh, digital health, but also pharma, medical devices. So yeah, I think it depends on each one's perspective, but I would try to think what can you bring to the table that it's unique and that no one else besides you can, can do that. And I think this has answered some of the questions. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can jump on to answer another question. I see that between the application and the outcome, there is quite considerable time that you put your career on hold to move to SF. And I feel this explains also like how biodesign um, fits in your professional path. It's definitely not something that you can do in parallel with something else. It's a full time commitment and investment. It's a it's a it's a career step. Um, so the program, and we also recommend that you devote, you give a hundred percent of your time and self to this experience. Um, so yes, this would mean making some hard decisions, whether it is stepping down from roles or, um, leaving roles. Um, and it's, it's, it's like a, a leap of faith you need to make. Um, and also for international fellows, you move from you move to another part of the world so you start your life in a different place um some people might have um traveled with family as one people is asking nathaniel can talk more about it some people just come on their own um but it's definitely a step you you don't take lightly it is a big change um and it's as Marta said, you you have already had some professional experience, so you're not a fresh, fresh graduate and you're doing this 
very intentionally um, thinking, what do you want to gain out of this experience and how do you want this to help progress your career forward? Yeah, and, and I would add to that, uh, Anastasia, I think that was a great answer, but uh, specifically I, for the for the period between you you applying and then you getting an answer, then that's that's your superior of, of uncertainty. I, like you gotta be willing to, you know, as Anastasia said, take that leap of faith, apply, and then keep doing your work, but knowing that it's it's possible that you would get in. And then the, t the time frame, uh, I'm sure it's been covered in other instances, but you, you do your application, then there's an interview round, and then there's some time before they actually tell you um, if you get in or not. But then you still have like six or you may, six or eight months before the program actually begins. So you do have time to put your things in order to get your job uh, you know, done, uh, talk to the people you need to talk to so things are well taken care of before you move. Yeah, and building up on what uh, Ignacio said, uh, it's very important um, to take advantage of the time after you have been announced um, as being selected to build the supporting structure that you need going forward uh, because uh, Anastasia is absolutely right. You need to devote 110% of your time to this. It's not something you can um, run parallel with things that you're doing back home or wherever it is that you're coming from around the world. So it's always important to have that support structure. Um, in my case, I had a company that we um, were doing quite a bit and to leave that company was not easy, but fortunately for me, I have a, an outstanding team. I have support structures and that has made it very possible for me to pay attention to the program because uh, this fellowship is a very life-changing opportunity and uh, it would be a real loss for you to be here and then you're very much distracted because uh, you'd find out that every hour counts uh, during this fellowship. So you wouldn't want to miss uh, any of the input that they're, they're presenting to you. you know? um, I would also like to touch on the logistics involved in coming with a family. So for international fellows, it's very important to know that um, biodesign is very supportive in many ways. Uh, they support you through um, things that just don't, don't pertain only to the fellowship itself, but how you live uh, out here in the Bay Area. But you definitely would need to plan for a family if that's the case for you. Um, by that specifically, I mean uh, it's a very expensive area. So you would need some kind of um, savings in order to support a family fully, depending on the size of the family though. But uh, outside of that, you are very much uh, comfortable and supported with what the Biodesign Fellowship um, presents. So I'll be happy to answer specific questions that regard you know, um, traveling overseas with family for the fellowship and how to manage having a company or something else going on uh, in the background why you pay attention to the program i will answer the question i see i think it's for sal thank you for your question around um, the different personal experiences with the program curriculum for those with different backgrounds what were your highlights and challenges i think this is a question we likely all could speak to um, i will start by saying that please don't think that if you're not a doctor or an engineer, this program is not for you. We want people with different backgrounds. And importantly, in the last three years, Biodesign has had more of a shift um, towards policy, digital health, health equity. And so we have started taking people with different types of backgrounds. So please don't self sense and think you can't apply if you're not a doctor or an engineer. Um, coming from a public health perspective, I think one of the challenges for me was that um, I have a slightly different lens slash strategic focus compared to others, and that's not necessarily a problem. I think biodesign allows you to be clear about what you want out of the process. You don't have to all get the same thing. With that being said, you have to work in a team, and if you're a team and you have completely different expectations, uh, that's an opportunity, I think, to do a lot of uh, learning from each other, right, to be able to work together. I do think um, from an, an honest perspective that 
sometimes it can be challenging to be an international applicant as well. I think that's part of what we want to um, be open about in this webinar is that you're coming into an innovation ecosystem which is wonderful and strong and is built on the American way of doing things. And I think we have to be cognizant that for many of us returning home, we don't have necessarily bodies like the FDA. Innovation takes a very different um, route in terms of the processes it needs to follow. There isn't the funding ecosystem. It, some of you may have, some of you may not, depending on where in the world you are. And so I think one of the challenges is learning the process, but being able to contextually apply it wherever you go next. And I think another thing is ensuring that you stand in your lane in terms of um, knowing what you can also contribute. I think it's really important as an international community that we are not just coming here to learn, we are also coming here to share our experience and our perspective. And what makes a wonderful, enriching community which appreciates diversity is having different types of people who are willing to share how things are done back home, differences of opinion and different ways of doing things. because the way it's done here is not necessarily um, the right way. I think we should accept that there are a plurality of ways of doing things. And so I think that can sometimes be challenging. And for many coming from education systems, which are dissimilar to the American education system, where you haven't done an undergrad and then a grad, and you haven't done a variety of subjects, you know, I think the Commonwealth education system is more, you study one thing, you do one thing, and arriving here, you may feel, you know, well, there's people who have done very different things. And I think that's not a problem. I think we should embrace where we come from. We should embrace the things that also make us different and not try to assimilate uh, and lose what makes us unique. And I do think that there are incredible people. Megan is on this call and, um, you know, should you join the fellowship, she's one of the people that can really help anchor you in terms of some of the challenges because for many of the American fellows they arrive and after their 10 months they it's quite seamless to continue with their careers but I just want to point out for many international applicants it's very difficult to to do that because if you want to stay it's not an easy thing with a visa there was a question around visas most of us come here on J1 visas which means you can't work outside by design which is appropriate you're here as an academic scholar and if you want to switch to a different visa and get a job here afterwards, that's not an easy process to do in 10 months. And I think people should be mindful and set realistic expectations that if you come here for the fellowship, it's most likely that at the 10 month mark, you will return to where you came from or the job you were doing or move to a new job. But it's not easy to stay here and start a new career visa wise. And there are, of course, ex different types of circumstances which may change that um, but for the most part that has been a complex issue and that that just is what it is it's not nothing to do with biodesign or Stanford that's um, the American laws and I think it's important to be upfront because I wish I had known that when I came how difficult it is after the 10 months to think about what next when your American colleagues will have any options and I um, this may be stating the obvious but for those of you who may not be aware, many health tech startups and smaller companies do not sponsor visas for international candidates because that's very expensive. So after buy design, your H-1B visas are typically sponsored by management consulting firms or by academia. And so your pathways are much more limited than your colleagues. And it's not to say you can't find ways around that, you can, and it's not a reason not to do this, you should. But it's just good to be aware of. Um, I think all of us wished we had perhaps known these facts earlier on. Does anyone else have more to say on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah I can I can uh, add on that a little bit. So there was another question regarding with this, like how much support we got from the program to do the visa processing. And I would say that's very streamlined, uh, the getting the visa process, because Stanford receives a lot of international, uh, you know, applicants, scholars, so the process is well known, like like Cyan said, you, you would most likely be applying for a J-1 visa. And the process to get the J-1 visa is, you know, just follow the steps. Um, they will send you documents on how to follow up. There's someone on the team, a CC, who would, you know, guide you through the process and make sure that you get things done in time. And for those that uh, make it to, to that point, it's very important to do things with time um, because sometimes embassies and consulates 
take uh, take a lot of time to process the documents, but but that's like Cyan said, that's completely outside of the program's control, and that's just part of how things are done. So I would say the support for for visa processes in general is there. Um, there's also an international center at Stanford called the Bechtel International Center, which provides a lot of support for J1 scholars. Uh, you just need to ask for it. You need, you need to engage with the center and ask those questions early on. They also provide uh, sessions where they go through all the requirements that you need to fulfill as a J1 visa holder. And uh, one last thing I think it's important to know for those that are thinking of coming to to the US on a J-1 visa is that some people from, from some countries have a thing that's called a skill list. So your country, when it sets the relationships with the US, the country does define a list of skills, skills that you know the government thinks are useful for the country. And so that list uh, basically defines that there are some you know, type of uh, professional programs or things like, for example, the Biosign program that might that might force you or have you go back to your country for two years after the completion of the program. This is called a two-year home rule requirement. And so that's also something that you should be aware of if you're applying so that you can plan accordingly uh, for that requirement. Awesome. Fine. Yeah, there's a very uh, interesting question about uh, overcoming imposter syndrome. And uh, Cyan mentioned something that I think addresses that perfectly well. Uh, she mentioned that don't lose what makes you unique, you know. So I think that's um, something really to hold on to. Do not lose what makes you unique um, throughout the application and even the fellowship itself, you know. So I think that's the best advice regarding that question. Um, I also like to touch on the question that says, how did the fellowship change your career? Um, so speaking from someone who is coming from you know from africa and doing health innovation it was a really strange experience for me personally because it was um i, I felt alone for many years uh there was no mentorship and i just kept reading books and then trying to power through so the best thing that i'll tell you is the support you get after the fellowship you know uh the network is super valuable uh, you have mentors from your colleagues, all to alums and to the faculty themselves. Uh, the community generally is very, very supportive. So I would say that the, the biggest change and impact you hear at least 70% of um, any fellow would be the network and the community of people that you're living uh, with going forward. Yeah, yeah I, I completely agree. I think like, it's not only about the methodology, which of course like changes the way you approach problems and your perspective. And it has like massive implications on your like professional and personal development. But yeah, it's also about the, the network. And I think uh, we obviously all believe that uh, biodesign is an amazing place to be, work and learn. And that's why we have all stayed like for more than the fellowship. And I think um, like when it comes to advice or when we were discussing challenges, I think there are things that are relatively easy to plan for, like housing, like coming to the U.S. ahead of time so that you can like do more paperwork than maybe other fellows who are not international do not need to do, or like thinking about getting a car, all these things. I think the logistics are relatively easy, at least for me, like, the main challenge and it's something that I was not prepared for is like how uh, yeah, like the impact that the fellowship has on your personal decisions as well. So in my case, I never thought I would stay more than one year. Um, and then like once you are part of this ecosystem and you realize that finally you can like work and do what you always dreamed about doing in the best place with all the best connections, resources, uh, funding, it's amazing so it's hard to make the decision to to just like leave and go back to uh, where you're from so i think i would also try to come prepared for that i don't know how how can anyone prepare for that but i guess like also knowing if you ever want to go back to your um, country like what's the skill set or what do you need like in order to to get back into the job market and like have a um 
an upgrade in terms of position because I think one of the main challenges is that at least in Spain, like for example, the um, um, entrepreneurship ecosystem is not as developed as in the US. So it may be challenging to work in the early stage. There's not a lot of experience or success cases. So it's kind of hard to innovate there. And then like if you're looking, looking into corporates, it's usually the case that uh, big corporations have like their headquarters uh, in other countries or in the US when it comes to innovation and strategic decisions. So I think, yeah, thinking about like what would be your next move if you, if you really want to go back to your country and preparing for that and building the skill set and connections that will prepare for that. Because like, um, yeah, otherwise like biodesign is like Disneyland of innovation. So uh, for sure you'll have like this dilemma of like what to do with your life. And at least for me, that was the main challenge. Yeah, I completely can echo that. And to, to close a little bit the discussion on moving in and then transition, because there have been a couple of, of questions around that. Um, there is also, Bidesign has the buddy system. So you get paired with um, a past fellow, like my buddy was Marta, um, that can give you some guidance and, and the things and how um, how to overcome those logistics. And you receive like a lot of resources um, it will be tough, uh, like having to do social security number and taxes and bank accounts and finding a house and all of these things. But um, if you're just considering whether you to apply or not because of these things, I would just like park it on the side and you will find a way to get through all of those logistics later on and there will be a lot of support. A lot of stress too, but you will get through it um, and it's still worth applying. And at this point, maybe reflecting exactly what do you really want to gain out of this experience? Because um, there have been some questions on like, what is the ideal applicant? Or like, what do the evaluators want? And think less of what do they want and more like, what do you want to gain out of this, this program? Because you're also putting your time and effort and investment in that. Um, so consider um, how learning this methodology and being part of this community of people can help you um, go forward um, and then whether that is staying in the U.S. or going back home and building other innovation ecosystems but don't let the logistics deter you from it you will figure it out uh, but it has to do more on like what is your true motivation uh, to gain out of it um, there was also a question uh, on the non-medical device projects that I want to touch upon, given my, my background is not medical device. I was doing digital health, even though I ended up working <laughs> on a medical device project. So by design, um, started last year, including digital health and biotech um, within their innovation process. It is traditionally a medical device community, but the whole methodology starts with you having a solution agnostic mindset. So you're really immersing yourself on finding the real needs and the real problems without thinking, what are you gonna be creating afterwards? And then when you go to the innovation phase, there are mentors from the medical device, digital health and biotech fields to guide you through it. Um, it's still work in progress on how you can actually do, for example, biotech innovations within that very short time and whether that's drug repurposing or a little bit less drug discovery in that sense. But the, the good thing about this methodology is that is, if you apply it at a systems level, it can be applied to whatever type of innovation because it's a process, it's a very modular and flexible process. So even if you don't have experience in medical devices or digital health, following the, the process will help you through it. And then that's also the good thing of having an interdisciplinary team and you get to learn a lot from, from your colleagues and teammates that have experiences in other spaces. Um, so definitely don't feel the third if you don't have the exact background for medical devices because um, innovation can take different shapes and forms. And we do have a class here at um, Stanford called Emergence, which is the biodesign for societal health. And from that class, as well as our digital health classes and our undergrad biodesign classes, we see that they create a lot of solutions which actually address social determinants of health. So for some examples, uh, the teams from this year, one of them have created a similar to like a TurboTax 
automated platform, but for helping immigrants get green cards instead of for tax, obviously, because they recognize that this is a huge issue when it comes to the mental health of immigrants. We've seen people address all sorts of environmental problems, um, you know, do uh, flood warning and sort of natural disaster um, warning systems. We see people do um, a lot of health literacy work. And so whilst the fellowship itself is still, I'd, I'd say more traditionally health focused, we do, we do have some teams that have looked at social determinants of health and different types of projects. We do say that this method is used all over campus with very different outcomes. And I think the fellowship is continually expanding and growing in the type of projects and areas we look at because we recognize that the medical device history is no longer appropriate, I think, for a changing society with dynamic needs and international fellows and people with different strategic focuses as Anastasia said. Yeah, there's a question here about um, what would you do or what would you have done differently in the fellowship if there is one? Uh, for me, I would say uh, certainly I would have loved to do things a bit with um, less desire to be perfect, you know? So being happy with small wins and not trying to be perfect all the time is something I would have done differently just to help me like get on to the next thing, you know? So I think that's one of the, the biggest takeaways for me here is that it's okay to be imperfect, but then you just keep moving, you know? So uh, having lingered so long on trying to be perfect at every single stage is something that I think I would have done differently. And I would say be happy with small wins because they do add up, you know? So it's a journey, it's a, a marathon, not a sprint. So uh, that's my, my, my take on that. I'll be happy also to hear from one or two other people about uh, what you may have wanted to do differently if there's, there's one. Yeah, and in my case, it's also on the personal level. I think I would have been, I should have been more confident in my skills. And I think that's also a challenge that I've seen happen more frequently sometimes in international fellows. I think in general, everyone who gets into biodesign tends to be a perfectionist and like really competitive uh, in what they do. So sometimes it's hard like to be in the same room with a lot of people with different opinions when you're maybe used to like saying something and people are like, oh, wow, that's great. So that may be a challenge. and. There are other things like, for example, if English is not your first language, at least in my case, at the beginning, this was like especially hard for me because I was not being confident for that reason. So I think, yeah, it's more on the personal level, trying to enjoy the experience and like really believing that you belong to biodesign because that's the truth. Like all of us at some point have felt this way, I think, but all of us belong here and everyone has helped us a lot like to progress in our careers and like advance, move forward and, and yeah, grow as a professional, but also as a, as a person. So yeah, I think it would be more on that. Like when it comes to projects or other decisions, of course, we could have taken like different directions, but it's something that, yeah, you decide as a team or individually uh, certain things, but I think it's more like personally, how do you enjoy the experience and uh, yeah, all this. How do you feel about this? There's another question from Kate Singh. Um, what are the most valuable skills and gains you have obtained through this program? I think a lot of that has been covered in the, let's say, quote unquote, um, content portion. Like there, there's, there's, Anastasia has described and Alice has described the idea of this process to identify the med needs and filter them, identify the most promising ones, and then create or be able to invent new technologies to solve them from a plethora of potential things, not just medical devices, but biopharma, digital health, or other things. So I think that uh, that's well known from Vatasign, but the things that I would, and I think this, this is personal, like everyone will have a different answer, but one of the things I think Vatasign does unbelievably well, I, I don't 
see anywhere else being able to do something like this is the fact that first there's this sort of like apprenticeship component to it you, your mentors are people who have actually built companies that are running those companies that have created solutions uh, systematically over time so it's it's not just reading about something it's not just uh, theorizing about how things are done these are people that have done it time and time again and you get the opportunity to discuss with them week after week your own project and in that in that way the fact that the fellowship is so practical in nature it means that for everyone that goes through it their learning experience is different because you observed different things in the hospital you came up with different needs and different concepts and so in a way you're making your own experience but you're getting this feedback and this um you know apprentice mentors mentor relationship uh with amazing unbelievable people which really uh will give you skills and knowledge that i don't think you can find anywhere else so that's like one big component that i think biodesign has that you you can there are many few there are not a lot of places where you can find something like that and the other thing is and this is again something that i think h1 will have their own opinions but uh, to me the the way you learn to work in a team so like marta was saying you, you get put in a team with three other fellows who come from different places all of them have been leaders all of them have had a lot of professional experience and so you need to learn how to work with very uh, you know successful very uh success oriented people in a way in a non-hierarchical way in a flat team and i think that is just great and it really sets the bar for whatever team you want to get involved in the future in terms of how do you define those relationships and how do you design your team so that you're able to succeed i don't know what you guys think yeah definitely definitely the people and the support you get is super important and there is a question on like give us like a real example of how what what is the support you get when you're building your project and in munich nasty for example we're in the same team um and our final project which was a treatment for a cancer side effect um the the support we got not only from biodesign but the stanford community has been super um super crucial for for the success of our project and the support can take forms of like you have all these clinicians and all these professors inside stanford um that can give you clinical information that can help you design your clinical study that can give you access to uh, to their labs so to see surgeries or to to talk with patients then you have all the facilities that help you prototype um uh, that help you create create your 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 device um you have all the technical support um you have all the business mentors that can help you form the what is the business model or, or the financial model or the health economic value model of what you're creating and then um you have the after towards the end of your fellowship after you've pitched and you've got all these feedback you have the opportunity to also pitch for extra funding which is what we did so we got summer extension to try some of these things um and move, see if your project has legs to continue beyond that and there are also a lot of grants and other areas that you can apply for funding like marta has done with her project too um so it's really a de-risked uh, rapid innovation process. Uh, it's similar to creating anything from scratch, but there is such a big, big network and resources here that you can tap on um, that really uh, accelerates the learning process. Um, and that's why it's good also to come with a, with an open mind. Don't come with like, oh, I really want to work on this, or I really want to explore this idea or this project, and I'll find a way to put it into it just come with an open mind and you will be surprised um uh which projects you'll end up working on and which needs will will really fascinate you and you will find that there is a true unmet need there um and you will figure it out that way i'd love to answer the question around visiting stanford first to check it out so um i don't want to uh, respond directly I want to ask another question to say you know for those of you wondering from far how do you know if this is right for you um, visiting is just one of them but we're taught about our design to de-risk and to prototype and so applying these two skills in action here um, if you are not sure that this is for you and you want to learn more the biodesign textbook is available online and to order. And we also have a biodesign site which has all our content. You can literally learn the process through videos, 
up, um, case examples, uh, you know, to actually get a sense of what the content is and if this is something you want to do. We also have a YouTube channel where you can see some of our events and see how the community um, is, the type of events we have. And I think by actually spending time with these resources, you'll get a good sense for content-wise what is happening. I don't think it's necessary to come all the way here. If you live locally and want to come to an event or stop past the center, please do. But, you know, for many people that cost is just prohibitive. And I don't necessarily think you may catch us on a day that a lot of people are at an event or working remotely. You may not get a sense of what the center is about. And there's a, that's why we do these webinars like this to share a lot of tools and resources. And for those of you that may realize that actually you'd love to do this, but it's not possible at this stage of your career or the traveling part is not possible for personal professional reasons. You know, you can learn this process and you can take advantage of a lot of what Biodesign has to offer through the resources available online. We also do, do, do have different hubs around the world. This isn't the only place you can learn Biodesign. There was a question about different hubs, um, I think in Canada. I don't know about Canada, but we do have um, Perth and Dublin and Taiwan and Japan. We have lots of different hubs. This is the sort of, um, this was the first, I think, Biodesign Fellowship because this is where Biodesign was born. And so uh, we're affiliated to the hubs. We aren't, that isn't the same program to be clear. But I don't want anyone here to feel like this is the only way you're gonna learn Biodesign is if you make it into this fellowship. There's many ways you can learn about um, what we do here and the different groups that exist and the different hubs. And so I encourage you to spend some time actually watching the videos and learning and if you have more questions after that, um, there is a team here who, you know, can answer them for you. Yeah, and yeah. also feel free to reach out and connect like via LinkedIn, for example, with alumni at Biodesign. I think we all did that when we were applicants or interviewing. So every time anyone reaches back to us, we always meet with them. So I think it's also like an option like to discuss and ask like more um, maybe like personal questions on like your thoughts about career and other things. We're always like happy to to chat and share our our perspectives. Uh, so yeah, feel free to do that as well. And I think um, yeah, like also don't be afraid of um, applying. I think as we mentioned, like all types of different backgrounds uh, tend to be selected. And like even if you think like you don't fall into like one of the classic boxes that may actually be an advantage for you. So apply and try it. And also, uh, I think it's good to know that there's a good percentage of people who also got in in the second attempt. So it's also something that you should consider that there's obviously a lot of people applying. And once you get into interviews, like sometimes it's more about like making the team composition uh, rather than meaning that you you would not be eligible in the future so i would encourage also like uh to people to apply more times and of course to reach to us if you have any questions yeah i think this would be a good time to add um because i've seen a, a few questions bordering around experience so uh, in line with what marta is saying i don't think you should be too worried about that. You should just be confident with um, the work you're doing and more importantly, what you intend to do with the biodesign uh, experience after having done the fellowship. So I understand your concerns around that. I felt exactly the same way. It's very intimidating applying for this program, uh, but uh, just be confident with what you have already done. I've seen people asking, um, how does it go for people who are just finishing their undergraduate or who are still affiliated with the university and are still uh, working on one project or the other? Uh, I would say experience really does help, but I haven't seen it explicitly stated anywhere that you must have um, X number of years of experience, you know? So I'll just say be, um, look more at the future of what you want to do with it and present your best leg forward with what you have already done. So don't worry too much about the experience. I'll just give you a tip uh, about one of the things that I did. I don't think I've said this out loud, but I deliberately did not read the bios of any of the other fellows until I had already gotten into the program. 
because uh, that is, so just focus on what you are able to present. It'll be very intimidating, I understand that, but um, don't worry too much about experience. I don't know what uh, others think about this. Yeah. And since we have like a few minutes left and maybe like to close that, there was another question about uh, what uh, each fellow has lined up or planning to do after the fellowship. And I think there were like several questions on this line on how the, the fellowship changed our career path and all that. So uh, I'm happy to start since I'm already talking. But um, so yeah, after the fellowship, I decided to uh, to pursue like the project that we came up with. Uh, so that's why I decided that the best option was to stay as a second year fellow. I was lucky enough to be part of Impact One, which is um, specialized in maternal health and pediatric innovation. And my project was within this field. So it has been extraordinary to have like all the resources uh, from Impact One and being able to stay for uh, two years. And now it will be a third one. So uh, in general, how it works uh, is that you stay like working on your project only for a, uh, a percentage of your time, but then you may also have other tasks or new projects for the second year. In my case, it was like repeating the process in maternal health, and then uh, this also helped me develop the project from the previous year. And yeah, I want to hear from all of you guys. <laughs> I'll go next. So uh, I was with Marta in the fellowship year. And I stayed on for a health equity fellowship. This was the first time by design had offered this fellowship. And what the focus was, was helping us um, at by design rethink the process of uh, the, the different steps we have, because we have now focused towards health equity in terms of our mission, and we need to make some adjustments in our process. And so a lot of it was thinking about different ways of teaching, different types of resources, to help projects that were health equity focused come to the center. Another thing was hosting monthly brown bag lunches. So this is something for those of you that may be interested in joining, but once a month um, we host a brown bag where we have different speakers on health equity and innovation topics. It's in person for the Biodesign and Sanford community, but anyone who wants to join online is always welcome to join in. And just generally bringing in different types of speakers, we brought in the impact investor community, we brought in innovators from different geographies who are working on challenging wicked problems and helping create a sense of, you know, if people really want to come here to work on public health um, problems or uh, issues of health equity, that there is the support and expertise to do that. I am finishing up that fellowship in September and I will be staying on then as the health equity lead where I will be um, teaching and I will be, we're doing, we've just finished a, a round of research on benchmarking best practices from other institutions around health equity. And I'm also working with the East Africa bio te biodesign team, which has just started their fellowship last year. And so I will be doing teaching and mentoring there. Ignacio, I'll pass over to you. All right. Well, I think a common theme uh, is the idea that after Vodasign, you might be interested in getting additional reps of what you've learned. And so just like Marta said, uh, in my case, I, I was presented with the opportunity to take a second year fellowship that was centered on the idea that there's a lot of innovation to be done in the congenital heart disease space. And so I'm staying to perform a landscaping exercise where I will be applying all the learnings from the Vodasign year to identify and, and characterize the most pressing unmet needs in the congenital heart disease space in a way that's that's um, that's easy to understand the landscape and where the needs are, uh, and also in a way that allows for potential uh, continuation of that work into development of potential solutions for those needs. So the way I, I looked at it, it was um, the, the way it was funded, it made sense that anything that comes out of that landscaping exercise would be actionable and might have and it might even have chances of being developed and carried forward. So in that sense, it, it looked like a very impactful way of getting additional reps in the vital sign process uh, while also doing meaningful work that's going to impact the lives of uh, children with congenital heart disease. But on the side, as Anastasia had foreshadowed before, um, Anastasia and I, were, our team, uh, came up with um, 
with a concept for the treatment of a breast cancer related lymphedema and so we got the opportunity to extend um, the development of that pro of that project for a couple more weeks to de-risk it and try to answer some of the most burning questions that will let us know the viability of it. So overall, I'm saying another year at Sanford, but I think uh, the most the most uh, or the as a way to close it, I would say um, BattleSign offers the opportunity uh, for you to try and continue what you've learned in a way that makes sense to you and that's that's what i've been doing yeah and um, so to follow up uh as ignacio said apart from our our lymphedema project which i'm really excited to keep working on um i'm doing also a second year fellowship so another year at stanford for the seer fellowship stanford initiative for entrepreneurs resilience and well-being so we will be interviewing a lot of entrepreneurs within the Bay Area to understand their uh, their their challenges and journeys, how they face adversity, what makes them resilient, and then use those findings to create some innovation in a scalable way that can help more entrepreneurs uh, from underrepresented groups join that community. Um, so the outcomes of this fellowship. No one knows what it would be, which is there was a question on like what what is expected as an outcome. There is no exact expectation. It's more like finding a true unmet need, a critical problem, and finding a way to innovate it the best way possible. And having this mindset that I don't have a goal, like what is the end goal going to look like, really helps you to create meaningful innovation. Whether for our case would be an educational framework or some sort of um, other type of innovation. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited to see how the by design process can be applied in that theme as well. Yeah, awesome. Uh, for me, I'm going back home to Nigeria uh, to see how to propagate the biodesign innovation process to affect the region by stimulating as much homegrown, um, impactful innovation as possible. I'll be going back also having had the opportunity to be part of the Impact One uh, Fellowship. So I'll be going back as a Global Maternal Health Fellow. Um, that entails looking for um, unmet needs in maternal and the child health space also as well. So really looking forward to um, what the future holds. I think the biodesign process itself, however it is that you eventually um, lay hold of it and learn it is very powerful and scalable as well. So looking forward to seeing how this changes everyone's journey, both on the call and for the fellows as well. So I'll turn it over to you, Martha. Thank you. Okay, so I think this is the end of our webinar. Um, feel free, as Martha said, to send more questions if you have and reach out um, if you feel like some of the topics haven't been covered and uh, help you guys apply and we're looking forward to seeing you at Stanford. Thank you. Bye everyone.